Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. There's debate among Christians about God's plan for Israel. Has God divorced Israel? Is there a plan for her still yet to come? Well, today we'll dive into Jeremiah chapter 3 and answer that question head on. Now, by way of a quick review, although we're only three chapters into this book, we're already seeing the unfolding of the central theme of the book of Jeremiah. The people have sinned against God and time is running out. And so for the next several chapters of the book of Jeremiah, the Lord is calling the people to repent and return to him. Now, if you've already read chapter 3, then you know it starts on off with a very heavy discussion about divorce. Divorce is a serious topic even to bring up, and there are a few things more discouraging than this very topic. And so this is especially sad that the Lord is talking about it here, because back in Jeremiah chapter 2, when we read that yesterday, the Lord starts out chapter 2 lovingly remembering their honeymoon and all the good things they had going on. But you'll remember that at the end of the chapter, chapter 2, it ends on the low note because the Lord's just been recounting their sins against them and how the people have abandoned God and committed adultery with the idols of the world. And so chapter 3 continues along that line of discussion and opens with this matter of divorce. And so verses 1 to 5 starts on off talking about the nature of divorce. Once the relationship has ended, can there be a return? And if Israel has committed adultery against the Lord, would he take her back? Well, the answer comes in verse 6. And verses 6 to 10 explores this important question. Does God still have a future plan for Israel? After all, if God has divorced her, as Christians, we might naturally think, well, the church has replaced Israel. But as we work through this passage here, we're going to see that's not the case. Verse 6 says, Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. And so the Lord is reminding Jeremiah's hearers of what's happened to Israel. Going on to verse 7, he says, I thought after she has done all these things, she'll return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And so Israel has rebelled against the Lord and refused to repent. And Judah sees this and she's not really paying attention to what's going on. And so in verse 8, the Lord says, And I saw that for all of the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. And so the Lord is quite clear here. Although he hates divorce, it is allowed in cases of adultery. And so the Lord has exercised his right and has thus divorced Israel. Now that's heavy stuff. But to understand the implications of verse 8, there's a lot more we need to go over. And this is where the groundwork that we have laid over the last few months is critical to understanding this very important verse. See, if you've been going through this podcast at least since late March or so, you'll remember that after the reign of Solomon, the nation of Israel divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Ten tribes went to the northern kingdom, and it's typically called Israel, which makes sense because you have all the sons of Jacob or the sons of Israel there. But then you also have the southern kingdom where just Judah and Benjamin kind of stayed together, and they're often just called Judah. Now, as you remember, the northern kingdom was pretty much apostate from the very beginning. The southern kingdom had periods of time where they seemed to follow the Lord, but not always, as we're going to find on out. And so because of the northern kingdom's apostasy that we're really just reading about in these verses we just read here, the Lord brings Assyria to come and invade the north in 722 BC, and they're deported. And that's key to understand here. You see, Jeremiah is writing these words, it says here, during the reign of Josiah, who ruled from 640 to 609 BC. And so the invasion and the deportation of the north has already taken place, actually like 80 to 100 years earlier. And so everyone in the south should know what's happened. And they know that the people who are now living to their north, they're no longer the Jewish folks because they're deported. They're just the people that the Assyrians had just kind of imported back to that region. And so the people of the south, people of Judah, know that Israel to the north is essentially gone. We're going to find in a minute not all are gone, but essentially gone. And now we're seeing why. The Lord is explaining that this is essentially a divorce. They've had an affair with these idols. They have brokered their covenant with God, and the Lord has divorced them from himself. Now, when the Lord has divorced Israel, that doesn't mean he has divorced Judah. You see, again, Israel and Judah are not the same country. And so to divorce Israel does not automatically mean that the Lord has divorced Judah. In fact, he never does. And here he's just warning them to repent. And so God has never divorced the southern kingdom. And that alone means that God still has a plan and a purpose for them. But we're still not done, because as we go on now to verses 11 and 12, even though there is a writ of divorce against the northern kingdom, 
Even still, the Lord has not abandoned Israel completely. Unlike most divorces, the Lord will still graciously take her back if she repents. And so in verse 12, he says, Go and proclaim these words to the north. Remember, who's the north? That's Israel. Well, weren't they already deported? Well, well, yes, but not every last person. And there are still Jewish people who are living there, and they still have an opportunity to hear these words repent. And so God does still have a plan for Israel and Judah. We're going to see that as we continue on in this chapter. But before we get there, let's just talk about repenting for a moment here, because that's an idea that's mentioned in several places in this chapter, as well as over the next few chapters. You see it in verse 12, or verse 14, and verse 22. The Lord is calling his people to return to him because they have strayed away and gone after false idols. And so the Lord calls them to return him in verse 12. And he, and he says, I will not look on you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. In verse 14, the Lord reminds them of his relationship with him. And he says, return to me, for I am master to you. Or some translations say, I am married to you, or I'm your husband. In verse 22, he says, return, I will heal your faithlessness. And so repentance is just this key theme in chapter 3, as the Lord is calling them to repent. Now, what is repentance? What if they actually did repent? What would it look like? Well, the biblical idea of repentance is about a change of behavior. I was once teaching a Sunday school class. I had some like fifth graders in the class, and I'd given them all like bags of chips. And then while I was teaching on repentance, I kind of snatched a bag of chips from one of the kids and just started eating his chips just right in front of him. And while doing it, I was eating the chips and kind of talking with my mouth full, saying, hey, I'm really sorry for doing this. I'm just sorry. But I just kept on eating them. And I got done. I looked at him. And the look at his face back at me was just, his shock face was classic. It was just very funny. And, and knowing me, his chips are gone. And so I said to him, would you say I repented of eating your chips? And the class was like, no. I was like, that's right. Repentance isn't simply saying you're sorry, nor is it simply just feeling sorry. Ultimately, true repentance means to change the wrong action. And that's what we see in this passage here. For instance, you look at verse 13. The Lord tells his people, Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord, and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree, and have not obeyed my voice. Along these lines, if we were to go to chapter 4, if you just turn a page over to chapter 4, you see more specifics about repentance. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Put away your detested things from my presence. In 4.3, he calls people of Judah to break up the hardness of your hearts. In 4.4, 4, they were to circumcise their heart, which is a further way of picturing what we see in verse 14 in chapter 4, where you just wash your heart from evil. Along these lines, over in chapter 6, in verse 16, the Lord says, Stand by the ways and, and see and ask for the ancient past where the good way is and walk in it. And then in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 3 and 5, he tells them to amend your ways and your deeds. And so all of this is showing us that repentance is not simply just a change of mind. It's a change of actions. It's where we come to the Lord, we confess our sins, and he gives us the grace to be free of them. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true repentance here. Well, going back to Jeremiah chapter 3, let's look at the blessings these folks would receive if they would repent. Going back to verse 15. In verse 15, he says, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. You see, when there is a repentance among the people of God, the Lord will give them shepherds after his own heart. Now that phrase, after his own heart, probably sounds familiar because that phrase was used of David as well. This is just a key for those who are in leadership of God's people that we must have hearts after God. But what does that mean? Well, it means that their focus and their intent is to serve God and accomplish what God wants. Uh, we don't need more people trying to accomplish their personal agendas because they're going to just lead us astray. We need leaders who are seeking to accomplish God's agenda to do what God would want them to do. And so look what these shepherds do in verse 15. It says they feed the people on knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is just, just simply knowing the facts and figures, but understanding is understanding the meaning behind them. Knowledge precedes understanding, and it is possible to have knowledge and not understanding. And the Lord's faithful shepherds are seeking to help people not only know information about God, but to understand it and how to live it as well. And so a sign that we are truly repentant before the Lord is that he will place us in contact with shepherds who are truly seeking to lead us into deeper, richer knowledge and understanding of God and his word. Well, this passage is ultimately talking about Israel and Judah. And look what will happen when both Israel and Judah repent and return to the Lord. Verse 16 says, It shall be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord, 
they will no longer say, The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and it will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. Now, that's a startling point. I mean, fact is, the Lord took the Ark away. We don't know when he did. We just know that it was taken away eventually. And it's obvious here that the creators of the movie, The Original Lost Ark, uh, they didn't read this verse because you can't find it. It's not coming back. Well, I mean, that is unless you're looking at Revelation 11, 19, which talks about the Ark being in the heavenly temple. But that Ark is actually speaking of the true, real Ark. Remember, this earthly Ark just simply pictures that true heavenly Ark, and that's where it is. But Jeremiah's point here in Jeremiah 3 is that the purpose of the Ark is done with. It's going to be set aside. We don't need Indiana Jones to help us find it. Now, why is it going to be set aside? Well, that's because the ark pointed to two things. Uh, first, the presence of God. Second, the people's covenant with him. And so in verse 17, you see the presence of God will be now in Jerusalem himself. You don't need an ark. He will be there himself. And the covenant will no longer be the covenant based on the old covenant of the law, but now the new covenant of the heart. And all of this is going to be happening at the end times. Verse 17 says, At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all of the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem for the name of the Lord, nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil hearts. And in all of this, verse 18 shows us that God still has a plan for Israel and Judah, because it says, In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. Remember, northern and southern kingdom there. And they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. And so when the people of God repent and return to him, there'll be this national unity among the Jewish people. And verse 17 says, the timing of all this is going to happen when all of the nations are being gathered to Jerusalem. Now, a few days ago, when we were studying Isaiah 66, verse 20, we saw that at the end times, the nations will stream to the Lord in Jerusalem. And we're seeing that same idea here in Jeremiah chapter 3. In those days, those days that are yet to come, when all the nations are gathered before the Lord, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the people of Judah, and the people of Israel will also return to the Lord and dwell in this land. In verse 19, they will once again call the Lord Father. And in verse 20, they will abandon their idolatry. And so all that's going to happen at the end times. But obviously those things have not happened yet, and there's still more to go. And so going back to our passage here in Jeremiah 3, in verse 21, the people of the north continue to lament their situation because they're unwilling to recognize and repent that they've done anything wrong. In verse 22, the Lord calls out to them again. And in verse 23, he tells them, you're following your own deceptions. He is the salvation. They should be saying, let us lie down in our shame and let our humiliation cover us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth even to this day. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. And so that's just the heart of this repentance that we'll one day see happening among the people of Israel. Well, that's chapter 3. Let's just go over some quick points of application here. First, does the Lord have a future plan for Israel? Well, absolutely. When the nations are gathered to her, she will be gathered too. She will end her rebellion against the Lord and she'll submit to God. In fact, she will be the locus of the end time events and all of the nations will stream to her and within her and through her, God's plans will come to completion. Now, another thing is this passage shows us the obvious, that God cares about our faithfulness to him and he calls us to repent when we're not. He's redeemed us out of this world to be devoted to him. And when we allow this world's priorities to creep into our lives and crowd out the Lord, we are essentially doing the very things that this passage is warning against. We are giving ourselves over to other interests rather than the Lord. And finally, as we examine our own lives, is there anything in your life that you know of that you need to repent of? Not just to feel badly about, but to actually change. If so, bring that before the Lord. Confess it and seek his grace to be delivered from it and let him rule that situation so that he will deliver you from that situation. Well, on that note, that's Jeremiah chapter 3. Thanks so much for being a part of this study together today. Hope to get to you tomorrow. Until then, have a great day. God bless.